Well, good evening, everyone. This is Gerald McKeegan. Uh, I'm with the Chabot Space and Science Center, but I am not at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Um, unfortunately, uh, Alameda County is still with the, um, they're still going through the uh, stay at home order. So I'm staying at home. Uh, but we still got a pretty good show for you tonight. Uh, hopefully, um, everybody is doing well and staying safe. Uh, for those of you in the Bay Area, I hope you enjoyed yesterday's earthquake. We had a 3.8 uh, uh, magnitude earthquake yesterday. Um, it's kind of funny how some people react to the earthquakes. When my wife uh, feels an earthquake coming, her instinct is to immediately dive under a desk. But I have a very different attitude. When uh, when an earthquake starts shaking the house, my reaction is to start waving my hand and going, wahoo. So very different reaction. So anyway, we've got a good program for you tonight. Uh, we've got a, a video about uh, what you can see in the sky tonight. And after that, I'm going to show you another video or, or some slides rather, uh, talking a little bit about one of the objects that we're going to talk about in the video. Um, I want to remind everybody, Chabot Space and Science Center is uh, a nonprofit organization. And because we are closed now because of the pandemic, uh, our normal source of revenue, uh, ticket sales and so forth, uh, that's not happening right now. So we do rely quite a bit on donations. So if you can hit that donate button and help us out, we would certainly appreciate it. We do a lot of live streams streaming programs like what you're seeing now. We're, we're, I think we're getting close to 100 uh, programs that we've done since uh, we were shut down. And we're going to be doing a lot more. It's probably going to be a couple more months at least before Chabot can reopen. So in the meantime, we've got people working on exhibits. We've got people working on all these live streaming programs and so on. And we really need your help to uh, keep all that going. So if you want to click on the donate button on the Facebook page uh, and, and help us out with that, or if you want to go to Chabot's website, ChabotSpace.org, uh, you'll see a donate button at the top of the web page there and you can donate that way and we would really appreciate it so anyway uh without further ado uh i'm going to introduce a video now uh this is uh, produced by don saito he is one of our uh volunteers at the Shimo space and science center he's an astronomer and he's really good at making videos and it's narrated by barbara sams who is a, a member of the east bay astronomical society which is a uh, astronomy club that is based at the Shimo space and part uh, uh Chabot Space and Science Center, and EAS partners quite a bit with Chabot on various projects. So uh, bear with me for a second here, and I will get that started. And here we go. Greetings, fellow Earthlings. With the COVID-19 pandemic as yet unresolved, we still can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center. However, we can still use nature's planetarium, also known as the real sky, to dress up warmly, step outside, tilt our heads back and see at least some of the amazing things I'll be pointing out for you tonight. I'm of course talking about the constellations. There are people, animals and objects up in the night sky. They've been there for millennia, but most people are unaware of them as they glide by unnoticed right over our heads every clear night. Tonight, we will amend this sad state of affairs and put you, the audience, on your first steps towards astronomical enlightenment. Begin. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's yearly orbital path around the Sun. That and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night, which changes our views of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, and if the moon isn't too bright, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully, 
but most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A first good step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass, using a star grouping that is quite easy to find, Cassiopeia, the Queen, also known as the Big W. Face the sky roughly 90 degrees to the right of where the sun had set and look almost straight up to the top of the sky and you'll see it. As you can see, Cassiopeia has five stars that make up the W shape, which is actually her throne. From this angle, it's kind of face down. The sixth star makes up the seat of the throne, which can be seen to have a rather unergonomic back. Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W, you might see another somewhat faint seventh star. Just connect the end of the W to that star and extend the line about two and a half times until it comes to the semi-bright star, which is named Polaris and is otherwise known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is. So no matter what time of the night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All of the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is, of course, an illusion caused by the Earth's rotation, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact, it is the Earth that's spinning. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top and you extend Earth's north polar axis straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace the curving handle of its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of the bowl are called the Guardians because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Using the non-squashed end of Cassiopeia, it points directly into the face of our next constellation, Cepheus, the king. And yes, he is Cassiopeia's husband. At this time of the night, He's face up, but he's got a triangular crown, a squarish head with a pigtail at the base of his head, and he's smiling, cause he's the king. Rising midway up the northeastern horizon, we find Auriga, the charioteer. He's easy to spot because of his bright eye star, Capella. It's just his head in profile, but he's got a triangular hat, a hook nose, his bright eye capella, and the rest of his large head with big manly chin. To continue, let's turn our view to the south, like so. This will flip everything we've seen so far upside down and will enable us to find the rest of the night's major constellations more easily. To find our next constellation, let's first look for the asterism known as the Great Square. By the way, an asterism is not a constellation, but merely a familiar star grouping. The brightest star of the square is the head of Andromeda, the chain lady. She's got one star as her head, a torso, and one arm pointing away from her body with a couple of chains attached. The other foreshortened arm is curled down below, and she has one straight leg, while the other leg is up and bent at the knee. If the sky is dark enough, you might see a dim, fuzzy spot just off her knee. Binoculars can make it plain to see in even somewhat light-polluted skies. That's the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest neighboring spiral galaxy at 2.5 million light-years from us, which makes it the furthest object that can be seen with the naked eye. It is on a collision course with our own Milky Way galaxy, but worry not. The collision won't happen for another five billion years, give or take a few hundred million. The other three stars of the Great Square make up the wing of our next constellation, Pegasus, the winged horse. His wing attaches to the rear end of his body, and he's got four legs, neck, and long horsey nose. 
To the left of Andromeda, we have her boyfriend, Perseus, the hero. He's got a tall, thin, triangular hat, a head, body, legs, and feet. His right arm is curled up behind him, while his left arm is reaching out for Andromeda's upper foot. Hugh's binoculars are a small telescope to look about one-third of the way between the tip of his hat and Cassiopeia to find the double cluster, two very pretty and relatively compact open star clusters. Arcing relatively high above the southern horizon is a kind of invisible line where the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic, and is also where the sun, moon, planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers, not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology, most don't, but astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work, we are in their debt. Our first zodiacal constellation is Pisces, the fishes. Pisces is also pretty faint, and you'd have to have a pretty dark sky to see it. But if you happen to be in a dark sky sight, you can see it with its two fishes, one triangular and the other round, and the V-shaped fishing line that connect them. Our next zodiacal constellation is Aries, the ram. He is also somewhat faint, but as you can see, he has a small triangular head, body, cute little tail, and outstretched front and rear legs as though he's running around in the starry fields. Located between Aries and Pisces, you'll notice a somewhat bright reddish star, which isn't a star at all, but the planet Mars. If you ever get a chance to see it through a telescope, do it. Sometimes, if the seeing conditions are good, you can actually see some of its dark surface markings and or its polar ice cap. Up next on our line of zodiacal constellations is Taurus, the bull. He's got a big, somewhat triangular-shaped head, two horns, front and back legs, a body, and a tail. Take a look at the tip of his right-hand horn, and you'll notice it's not a single star, but a small cluster of stars that kind of resemble the Little Dipper. That is the open star cluster called M45, or more commonly, the Pleiades. The Japanese call it Subaru, and if you look at the medallion on the front of every Subaru vehicle, it shows those stars. Use the binoculars to look at it. It's actually quite beautiful. Our last zodiacal constellation, newly risen in the east, as constellations do, is Gemini, the twins. This constellation is one of the easier to see, as it is composed of two very bright stars, along with the rest of all the stars that make up their arms, bodies, and legs. Leaving the ecliptic, I've saved the best for last, Orion, the hunter. This constellation is composed of the most bright stars of all the other constellations from both the Earth's northern and southern hemispheres and is known by most people in the world. He's got a little tiny head, broad shoulders, He's holding aloft a somewhat faint club in one hand, while his other holds forth a shield. Then there's his famous belt of three stars, a sword hanging from his belt, and his legs and feet. If you look closely at his sword of three stars, you'll notice the middle star looks a bit fuzzy. Take another look with a pair of binoculars, and you'll see that it's not a star, but a fuzzy little smudge. A look with a telescope will reveal a cloud with striations and details. This is the great nebula in Orion, a place where new stars are being born, a sort of stellar nursery, if you will, and as you can see, quite beautiful. And that's it. There are other smaller or fainter constellations out there which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them by the author H.A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. 
Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts were drawn. The astro-scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for convenience they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon for about $12. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars that are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned, there are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us all very happy. And we'll see you in the future! All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Learn a little bit about uh, what's up in the sky right now. Uh, we're enjoying the wintertime skies, which means the nights are very long. <clears throat> and also we have a lot of really cool, interesting things to look at. I uh, want to remind everybody that uh, if you've got any questions or want to make any comments, there is a comment section on the uh, Facebook page page. Uh, I've got uh, Jessica Williams uh, in the background. She's watching the Facebook page and the YouTube page. And so if you've got any comments, got any questions, feel free to uh, put them in there and we'll be, we'll try to answer them anyway. I'll, I'll do the best I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll make one up. So, um, hey, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about one of the objects that uh, Don talked about. He talked about the Orion constellation and a little bit about the Orion Nebula. So I wanted to share with you uh, some slides here to talk a little bit more about that so you understand what it was that he was trying to say. So bear with me for a second here. I'm going to share the screen again. There we go. Okay, so if you uh, go outside right now, and actually around nine o'clock, 9.30, something like that. <clears throat> you go outside and look high in the Southern sky, you will see the Orion constellation. This is what it looks like right here. This is uh, uh, the Betelgeuse, a, a super giant star about 720 light years away. This is Rigel, a very hot bluish white star. Uh, this is Orion's sword, his belt so forth. Uh, this is the Orion constellation. Now, if you uh, kind of zoom in, maybe with a pair of binoculars, oh, by the way, that's the, the outline that you typically see in, uh, in uh, constellation guides and so forth, uh, just to help you figure out what it looks like. Um, if you kind of zoom in, maybe you look in with, at it with a pair of binoculars, uh, a couple of distinguishing features. Uh, first of all, is the belt of Orion. It's three stars that are lined up uh, almost in a straight line and uh, kind of evenly spaced. That's one of the distinguishing features about the Orion constellation that makes it 
so easy to find in the night sky. Another distinguishing feature is the fact that it's got more bright stars than any other constellation in the night sky. So it really stands out. So it's an easy constellation to find. Uh, if you read astronomy books uh, and they start talking about constellations, it's almost always uh, the Orion constellation will be the first one they talk about because it's so easy to spot and so distinctive. So anyway, uh, those three stars form what we call the belt of Orion. Uh, down below, right down here, you have what's called the Sword of Orion. Uh, it's a fainter string of stars, uh, or at least it looks like a string of stars. But when you kind of zoom in on the uh, belt of Orion, or the, I'm sorry, the Sword of Orion, uh, say with a, with a telescope, even a modest telescope, you'll notice that it has a, a little bit different appearance. It doesn't look like stars. It looks like a bunch of fuzzy objects. So here's the belt of Orion up here at the top. And here's the Sword of Orion. And right here in the middle, you see it's kind of fuzzy and there's not a distinct star there. When you get even tighter on that, you see what is really there. So this is an image taken with uh, one of the telescopes up at the Chabot Space and Science Center. This is the Great Orion Nebula. It's that little fuzzy patch that you see right here in the middle of the sword. The Great Orion Nebula is a huge cloud of gas and dust out in space. It's a little over 1,300 light years away. And within that cloud, new stars are forming. This is how stars form. They form from condensing clouds of gas and dust out in space. There's a lot of gas and dust out in space. And when those clouds start to mutually, the, the, the molecules in the clouds start to mutually attract each other by gravitation, uh, the, star, the clouds start condensing. And eventually you get little knots of much denser uh, cloud material and that's where stars begin to form. And it's quite common for a thousand or more stars to form within a huge dense cloud of gas and dust. And that's what's happening in the Great Orion Nebula. It, uh, is condensing and it has little uh, pockets of gas where or, or rather clumps of gas that are condensing to form new stars and what you see uh, at the at the center here well, it looks very bright in this photograph when you look at it through a telescope um, these th there are some stars here that actually stand out when you look with your eye your eye has a much better dynamical range than a camera does. So you can see faint objects and bright objects and distinguish them a lot better than a camera can. So this is actually a group of stars here we call the trapezium. And there are four very hot, very bright stars. Uh, I've got another image here taken with our biggest telescope, which has the smallest field of view. This is taken with our 36 inch telescope uh, at Chabot, uh, zooming in on that one uh, region. And you see these bright stars here. These are very young stars that formed from the cloud of gas and dust. Uh, these stars are extremely hot because they're very massive stars, have many times the mass of our sun. And because of that, the more massive a star is, the hotter it burns. Uh, it, it uses up its fuel much more rapidly than the sun does. And so it's it, very hot. And extremely hot stars put out a lot of ultraviolet radiation. That ultraviolet radiation uh, goes out and hits all this gas and dust and uh, ionizes the molecules in the gas and causes the molecules to actually glow. Actually, it's the atoms w within the uh, gas that are glowing uh, because of the ionization caused by that ultraviolet radiation. At the same time, you've got a whole lot of light coming from those stars and that light reflects off the gas and dust. And so we get two different kinds of nebulae uh, 
all in one here. We get uh, what's called a reflection nebula and an emission nebula. Reflection means it's reflecting light back to us from the stars, and emission means that the, the molecules and atoms within the, the gas cloud are actually emitting light. Uh, so you get quite a display here, and you'll notice it's very colorful. Uh, there's two dominant colors that you see when you look at the Orion Nebula. One is this kind of pinkish color that you see in various shades of pink. And the other, uh, if you look carefully, it's kind of a, a turquoise green, maybe bluish green color. Uh, the, the pink color comes from hydrogen. The cloud is actually mostly hydrogen. And when hydrogen is ionized and hit by that ultraviolet radiation, it emits uh, this kind of a, a deep red color uh, that uh, shows up uh, in, in you know, photographic exposures that are long exposures. The, uh, the turquoise color comes from oxygen. So there's not a lot of oxygen in this cloud but what there is glows extremely brightly, actually much brighter than hydrogen. Uh, and it glows in this kind of a uh, turquoise color. Uh, so even though the, the oxygen is, is only a small component of the cloud, because of the way oxygen reacts to the uh, uh, ultraviolet radiation, it, it glows with a very, very bright uh, bluish green color, whereas, expose hydrogen gas to the same amount of ultraviolet radiation and it, and it glows with a very, very dull, faint pinkish or reddish color. So that's what you're seeing here. And again, this cloud is, is condensing, forming new stars. Uh, the, the four stars in the trapezium are just some of the new stars that you see forming in this cloud. In fact, most of the stars that are forming in the cloud, you can't even see with this image. Uh, when the Hubble Space Telescope points at the Orion Nebula, they can zoom in and get very high re resolution images of small portions of the cloud. And in those images, you see these little dark knots of uh, gas. Those are actually gas cocoons around newly forming stars. That's, that's what happens. Uh, you get these uh, dense regions of gas they condense and form uh, like a cocoon that eventually becomes a swirling spiral of gas and that's where the new stars form so there actually are probably well over a thousand young stars still forming within this cloud uh, but these really massive stars here have already formed and they're emitting so much radiation that they're actually pushing the cloud away from them so that it's created a pocket within the cloud. And then you see this dark region here, that's actually a portion of the cloud of gas that's actually between us and the trapezium, uh, whereas some of this other gas is actually behind it a little bit. So this is a very much a three-dimensional image now, when people look through a telescope, uh, especially our big telescope at Chabot, and look at this object, uh, they see these three stars here, and they say, oh, that must be the belt of Orion, and unfortunately, they're not. In fact, if I back up here, well, I'll, I'll start with this one. This is an image of uh, with a smaller, wider field uh, telescope, and you see the same three stars right there. And when we back out even more, here's that entire nebula, and those three stars are right down in there somewhere. And way up here are the three stars that are the belt of Orion. Uh, our our 36 inch telescope at Chabot has a very small field of view. It can only see a portion of this cloud right here. That's about all it can see at one time. So when you see this image, you're not looking at the whole constellation. You're just looking at a tiny portion of the, the sword of Orion. And again, this is where new stars are forming. Now, curious thing, uh, 150 years ago, astronomers had fairly good telescopes. 
um, and they could see the Orion Nebula and they could see other clouds of gas and dust out in space. And there was a lot of debate about what they were, especially some of those faint fuzzy objects looked like they had spiral shapes to them or sort of elliptical shapes to them. And then others were just very irregular like what you see here. And there was a lot of debate about what those faint fuzzy objects were. And some astronomers were certain that they were truly clouds of gas and dust, while others astron other astronomers were convinced that they were actually much more distant objects that were uh, clusters of millions of stars that were so far away that you couldn't distinguish individual stars. You could only distinguish uh, them as, as what looked like a cloud. Well, it turns out depending on what you were looking at, one or the other could be right. When you were looking at the Orion Nebula, you are seeing mostly a lot of gas and dust, a true cloud. But when you were looking at a distant galaxy, uh, which looks to a, an older uh, telescope, like just a spiral shaped fuzzy cloud, uh, what you're actually seeing is hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, but they didn't understand that 150 years ago. In fact, it wasn't really until the, the early 20th century that astronomers understood that those spiral, spiral, what they called nebulae at the time, were actually galaxies, other island universes uh, full of billions of stars. So it turns out both uh, answers were right. It just depended on what you were looking at. All right. Okay, well, a um, couple other things I wanted to remind you uh, that are coming up here. Let me get out of this here. Uh, coming up later on this month, uh, we're going to do a presentation about the upcoming landing of uh, the, uh, uh, the Perseverance rover on Mars. Uh, you may remember that back in July, on July 30th, I believe it was, uh, NASA launched another rover to Mars, and it has been traveling toward Mars ever since. And it's scheduled to land on Mars on the 18th of February at about noontime Pacific time. And so it is getting closer. And we're going to do a little presentation on the 29th of, uh, of January. Uh, that's a Friday evening. And we will talk a little bit about the steps that are involved in landing on Mars. And we'll just go through the whole landing sequence. And then on February 18th, uh, Chabot will be live streaming the, the landing. We will be showing the NASA video. Uh, we'll have a couple of guests here to uh, answer questions while you're watching it. And uh, we'll follow all that. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, we'll have another uh, astronomer uh, doing a presentation going into more detail about the spacecraft itself and the components on it and uh, how the, all those components work together during the landing. So uh, we've got quite a bit coming up here uh, about the upcoming landing of uh, Mars 2020, the Perseverance uh, rover. It's going to land on Mars at Jezero Crater. And it's bringing with it a little helicopter. Uh, that uh, rover has a little helicopter that's attached to the top of it. And after it lands and starts roaming around a little bit, the helicopter is going to take off and fly around. And so we're going to get uh, not only the camera views that the rover sees, but we're also going to see what the helicopter sees. And one of the cool things that uh, Perseverance is going to do, which is very different than the other rover has done, Perseverance is going to be gathering up samples, storing them, and then there will be a future mission going back to Mars that will retrieve those samples and bring them back to Earth. So that'll be our first opportunity to uh, look at pristine samples of Mars uh, taken on, on site at Mars. All right. Uh, let's see, Jessica Williams is on there. Uh, I want to check with her and see if there are any questions that we need to answer. Uh, Jessica, if you're on there. Hi, Gerald. Hi yeah, there. We have, couple, we have a couple questions that came in. Okay. Um, the first question is about the Orion Nebula, and someone asked where the dust comes from. Where the dust comes 
from. Okay. Well, actually, the dust comes from dying stars. Um, there are have been stars forming for uh, you know billions of years, 13.8 billion years to be exact, and some of those stars have died. And when they die, some of them die in supernova explosions. Others die in a, a much slower process where they form what we call planetary nebulas. But in either case. Uh, not just gas, but also dust is blown off the star and that goes out into space. And over time, that gas and dust uh, kind of brings itself together through mutual gravitation and you get these dense clouds. There are actually a lot of clouds out in space. Um, if you can find yourself a really dark location in the middle of summer, stay up around midnight, say in, in mid-July, and then if you're in a really dark location, you'll be able to see the Milky Way galaxy, which looks like this uh, broad swath of, of stars, faint stars and a glowing uh, uh, trail across the sky. And if you look at it, you'll see what looks like dark patches in it. And people used to think those dark patches were gaps in the Milky Way. It turns out they're actually huge clouds of gas and dust out in space. So that dust and the gas uh, but mostly that dust comes from dying stars stars that died you know millions or billions of years ago and that dust is now accumulated into new st uh, clouds all right any other questions yeah um is the celestron 127 eq telescope a good one to start with uh <laughs> well it's not a bad telescope uh, especially if you want to uh, do astrophotography, assuming that you have a good mount. Um, astrophotography requires not just a good telescope, but a very good mount as well. Uh, but I don't recommend that type of a telescope for beginners. Um, actually, the thing we recommend most for beginners is not a telescope at all, but a pair of binoculars and a good astronomy book, uh, as was mentioned in the video. And uh, using binoculars and a, and a good book that uh, shows you some of the highlights of the night sky uh, you start learning your way around you learn where the constellations are you learn some of the where some of the brighter interesting uh, objects are what we call deep sky objects these are objects that are outside of our solar system um, and you get to see them and learn your way around I then recommend uh, that you kind of work your way up to progressively more um, uh, involved telescopes. Uh, the first be beginner telescope that I recommend is called a Dobsonian telescope. It's a simple reflecting telescope. Uh, typically you can get one for around six inches or eight inches in diameter and you can get um, um, a, a, a mount, it's like a, a looks like a lazy Susan. That's a typical Dobsonian mount. Uh, it's not a real fancy mount. It's just it swivels and, and you point the, the telescope wherever you want to look at. The optics on the telescope itself is very good. So you will see those faint uh, uh, deep sky objects in a lot more detail, but it's not a tracking telescope. And that lets you you know, see a lot more about what's out in the sky. And there are a lot of astronomers, that's all they ever get is a good Dobsonian telescope. But if uh, you wanna get into more serious astronomy, especially if you wanna do astrophotography, that's where that 127 millimeter um, uh, refracting telescope is a good choice. Um, it uh, it gives, will give you very good uh, astrophotos, but you need a really good mount. Uh, you need a mount that uh, is automated, that can track the stars and do it very accurately. And then you need to be able to mount your camera on that and be able to track very accurately in order to take good astrophotos. Uh, but that's something you, you should uh, kind of work your way up before you start jumping right straight into astrophotography. All right. Any other questions? Well, it looks like that's all the questions for now. Oh, okay. 
All right, well, folks, if you have any other questions, you know, now's the time to jump in. A um, couple of other things that are coming up uh, later on in, in uh, March, we've got an asteroid that's going to come up, uh, a fairly good sized asteroid that's going to come not real close, but sort of close to the Earth. And we're going to try to track that with our big telescope and uh, share that with you. And let's see, we've got a supermoon coming up later on. Uh, and uh, bear with me here, I'm get, getting a message. Okay, I see we have another question. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, uh, I read yesterday the planet Uranus pa uh, paused in the sky to do retrograde loop. Can this be explained and to other planets and do other planets do this? Okay, retrograde and prograde. Um, the, all of the planets in our solar system orbit around the sun in the same direction. So if you were high above the sun, looking down on high above the North pole of the sun, looking down on the solar system, all of the planets would appear to be orbiting the sun in a counterclockwise direction. Um, and so we call that prograde motion. When uh, the planets move around the sun, they're in prograde motion. And when we see the planets uh, and, and carefully track their motion across the sky, most of the time they appear to be in prograde motion. So we see them slowly moving across the sky from west to east. Um, but once in a while, the, the planets appear to reverse direction. Um, the most noticeable one is uh, Mars, but Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all do the same thing. And prograde motion means that for a while they seem to go backward. And this is because we are passing between the planet and uh, the sun. And as we pass between the planet and the sun, uh, there is a brief period of time where because of the way the angles work and, our, and, and the fact that the Earth is moving faster than the planet, it actually makes the planet appear to be moving backward. The planet is not moving backward. It is still moving in prograde motion, still moving in the same direction around the sun. But when we're comparing the appearance of the planet against the background of stars, it appears that the planet is moving backwards. Now, you can kind of simulate this if you imagine driving down a freeway and you're in the fast lane and there's a car over in the slow lane and it's up in front of you and you look at that car and it's going a little bit slower than you are uh, but you can see against the background it's still moving in the same direction relative to the background but as you overtake the the car and pass it the car appears to move backward relative to the background and that only happens for a brief time when you get very close to the car or as you're passing the car after you've passed the car and gone a little ways in front of it, it now appears again to be moving in the same direction as you are relative to the background. Now, again, both cars are moving in the same direction. It's just you're moving faster. And as you pass the car, there's a brief period where the car, its relationship to the background actually makes it look as if it's moving backward relative to the background. And, and that's what's happening right now with Uranus. Uh, we are passing between Uranus and uh, the sun. And so Uranus has been going, uh, appearing to go backward, but at some point that stops and then it reverses direction and starts appearing to go forward again or, or prograde again. So that's what we're talking about when you hear that the, the planet's motion appears to have stopped. It's just we've reached that point where it's no longer going in one direction and is now appears to be reversing direction and going the other way. And it's just, a, I wouldn't call it an optical illusion. It's just 
the way the angles look as we're viewing the planet. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, this is two questions. Um, what is a good starter mount? And then what is a good tracking mount for a four inch tube? Oh, gosh. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, starter mounts. Uh, like I say, the, to me, the starting telescope is the, the, the um, Dobsonian telescope. Um, the Dobsonian telescope has a mount that's like a lazy Susan mount. It's what we call an alt azimuth mount. So it moves up and down, uh, which is uh, moving up and down in altitude, and then it swivels uh, back and forth in either direction, uh, which is the azimuth direction. So we call it an alt, alt azimuth or altitude azimuth mount. Um, but the problem with that is if you're looking through the telescope for a long period of time, uh, the telescope is not tracking. So uh, as the Earth rotates, whatever object you're looking at will slowly drift out of the field of view. Now, with a Dobsonian telescope, that's easy to adjust for. You just nudge the telescope every few minutes and keep the objects uh, in the field of view. A tracking telescope, and there are many different versions of these tracking telescopes, uh, has a little motor. And the telescope mount is made so that uh, the motion around one of the axes of rotation mimics the east-west motion of the stars across the sky caused by the rotation of the Earth. And by uh, using a little motor to drive the mount in that east-west direction at the same rate that the Earth is rotating, uh, you keep the star centered. So it automatically adjusts for the rotation of the earth and it keeps the star or the planet or whatever you're looking at centered in the field of view. Now, there are some relatively inexpensive ones. Uh, uh, there's a company called Orion Telescopes. They make several inexpensive ones. Uh, companies like Celestron make them. Uh, and the, the less expensive ones, they track fairly good, good enough for you to do visual observing. Uh, but if you want to do astrophotography, you need a much more uh, robust mount. Um, there's a, a mount called a Celestron CGM, I believe is what it's called. And Orion makes one called an Atlas. Um, and there are other brands. There's some very expensive uh, brands. There's a company called Astrophysics that makes very expensive uh, mounts where the mount costs more than the telescope. Um, so th those more expensive mounts, uh, they're very heavy and they track very precisely. You align them so that they're precisely aligned with the axis of rotation of the Earth and uh, the telescope or the mount rather than tracks with the telescope so that it uh, keeps, keeps the object that you're photographing uh, centered just right within the telescope. It also has an attachment so that you can have a second telescope, a smaller telescope with a camera called an auto guider. And the auto guiding uh, camera actually sends signals to the mount to correct for slight deviations in the tracking. Uh, the auto guiding camera, actually you pick a star in the field of view of that camera and the camera then watches that star. And as soon as it sees it start to drift the tiniest amount, it sends a signal to the mount to adjust for that drift and correct for it. Uh, and that's called auto guiding. And that's what you need to do really good precision astrophotography. Uh, but to get those mounts that are very robust, that can uh, hold different size telescopes, and that can track very accurately, that's where you start spending a lot of money. Um, it's uh, quite common to see mounts like that cost several thousand dollars. And some of the, the best ones cost over ten thousand dollars so uh you're getting up there so you you, you don't want to go there unless you're going to be a really serious uh astrophotographer all right you said there was another question actually that's it oh okay 
All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed it tonight. Uh, and again, if uh, you want to keep uh, keep these programs going, help us out. Uh, click on that donate button at uh, uh, on the Facebook page or go to the Chabot website, ChabotSpace.org. And you'll see a donate button at the top of the web page there. You can donate there and help us out so we can continue doing the live streaming like we did tonight. All right. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, then I guess I can say good night. And we will see you in a couple of weeks when we do the uh, uh, Mars landing program. <laughs>